seconds, Elizabeth. Sorry about that rough beginning. And I do that to make a point. This unit, unit three, we're going to talk about the importance of a good beginning and the fact that you never get a second chance to make a first impression. I know you've heard that before, but there's a lot of people in the world who just write us off if we don't start out the gate strong. I think about it with all the horse racing that has been on. This is kind of the season of that. And the importance of getting that horse out of the stall and starting really fast can make a real difference in the way the race uh, progresses. So introductions and speeches are equally important. And this whole unit is about organization and, introduction, and introductions and conclusions. And when you think about an organized speech, uh, someone once told me that the recipe for a good speech is just simple. Tell us what you're going to tell us, and then tell us, then tell us what you told us. There's something about the magic of three times of hearing information that really clicks with a person. So if you lay out and organize your speech in that fashion, you will hit people three times with the main points. So I want to spend just a little time this uh, unit going over the PowerPoint with you. And there are a lot of reasons why we need an introduction. Um, one reason is that you need to grab people's attention. And um, that is, you know, our attention is really hard to grab because we live in a world where people can um, multitask or they think they can multitask and that we are always surrounded by technology. And so our attention spans are short. If we are not entertained, we don't give people very long before we switch mediums, go to a different vine, uh, go to a different television channel. Um, uh, the second one, the need to declare your speech topic and purpose. I like to embed that. I don't like to hear someone say, today I'm going to tell you about domestic violence. I would rather you start in a more creative way. Um, we do need to hear where we're going. So remember that I am the only one who's going to see your outline. So you need to provide an oral outline for everyone else in the audience, and that's what you're going to do through a preview. You need to tell us why you're qualified to give this speech. In the self-speech, that was not a big deal. Who else would be more qualified to give a speech than you? However, in, um, in a speech that's informative or persuasive, you need to prove to us that you are not necessarily an expert, but that you know more than we know about this topic. And you can do that pretty easily. You can say, I have been interested in rock collecting since I was 10 years old. I've gone on vacations, I've read books, and thus I would like to share my love um, and some inf interesting information I've learned about rocks with you today. So it doesn't have to be that you're published in the field, it can just be that you are interested in a school bus safety because your kids ride school buses and so you've decided to research the safety of school buses. You also need to early on give the audience a reason to listen. That's what a with them is. What's in it for me and the audience is the me. We know that you've chosen a topic that you're interested in, but you need to give us a reason why we should be interested. And remember, um, that, can be, that can be anything. Um, you drive on the road with school buses. Uh, wouldn't you like to know how safe the kids are in there? Who seemingly seem to be bouncing around that vessel? Wouldn't you like to know uh, why those kids don't need to be buckled up? Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about a vehicle you share the road with, school buses, and that's a with them. So a couple of notes on introductions. Never try to write it first. If you have to preview your main points, you need to know what your main points are. So write the um, introduction after. Um, I say write the introduction pretty loosely because I don't expect you to be writing out your speech at all. I never want your speech to be a manuscript that you later convert to a keyword outline. I think that is a useless step and I would rather you just plan the speech with the speech preparation worksheet where you just break out your paper into columns and you keyword uh, your main points, but you never script it out. 
if you are going to write something out, I would let you write out the first sentence that you're going to say right out of the gate and memorize that first sentence and maybe the last sentence of your speech too. The introduction of your speech should never be more than 10 to 15 percent of it. And what that means in um, a five minute speech, you need to be done with your introduction by 30 to 45 seconds of your speech. Um, 20% of your speech is one minute if you're giving a five minute speech, so you don't have a lot of time to invest. So now we're gonna quickly go through some types of introductions. Uh, one is a reference to the occasion. That works really well, of course, on a special occasion speech, um, but it could work on some other speeches too. Let's say that you're interested in giving a speech on Independence Day customs in the United States and we're going to be meeting this summer. We're going to be having two speeches in July. So you could say, hey, this is the month of patriotism. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, why we do what we do to celebrate our um, independence from Great Britain. There are two types of questioning introductions. Uh, so this slide should really say two types of questions. The first one would be an audience poll where you actually ask for a show of hands. And when I do that, I usually raise my hand too. Like how many of you ate breakfast this morning? And I'd put my hand up. Um, a second type of questions is a rhetorical question. And that's a question for consideration. Why do women not leave abusive situations? You're not really expecting anyone to raise their hand or shout out an answer. In fact, you hope that they don't. Um, but you're asking them to think critically about the topic that you're going to be talking about today. A startling statement. Anything can be sensationalized. I mean, just watch the trailers for the news. Uh, stay tuned at five o'clock. You'll find out what's in your kid's school lunch and why you might want to pack tomorrow. Um, those kind of things just make you want to tune in and sometimes they're overhyped, but um, Startling statements do usually get people's attention. We love quotations. I especially love quotations. And the quotation doesn't even necessarily have to pertain to directly to your speech topic. If you think of it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, um, that could go on a speech just about anything. If you wanted to give a speech on a certain era and you could talk about it was the best of times because you know, fashion was good and things like that, but it was the worst of times because we were fighting war. Um, so it, you can use the words of other people. I think it's a great holistic approach to use the same quotation at the beginning and the end of your speech. So it feels like you come full circle. Again, this is your assignment for the discussion board. A narrative gets personal and we like it when we create bonds with the speaker as audience members. We like to know more about you. Um, people find you interesting. So also you can get narratives that you read. If you read articles and there are good stories about people who survived um, certain medical conditions or that you're going to give a speech on juvenile diabetes and you find a great story about a kid <clears throat> who is living with it, you don't necessarily have to know that person. And we all like a joke. But what I want to caution you about with jokes is, yes, they need to be in good taste, and it's sometimes hard to find those. But because your speech is short, everything that you say needs to relate to your topic. So make sure that the joke is apt, that it um, relates to your topic. If, if I'm giving a, a class lecture for 75 minutes, I have a lot more time to put a joke in the beginning that it may or may not relate to my speech. <clears throat> But when you're only speaking for five to seven minutes, everything you say needs to relate. So I'm not opposed to laughing. I think when you laugh, you break bonds, and you break down walls with an audience, and that's important. So those are good reasons for introductions. When you think about a conclusion, it's equally important that you plan a conclusion. We will have time cards for our speeches, and it's really important that you don't see the five-minute time card and just quit, but you actually bring your speech to a close. <clears throat> Sorry, it's kind of like driving with someone. It's important to, to watch the road signposts rather than just jerk the car off at the exit because um, it's an abrupt shift if you just, you know, get the car off. But if you know, hey, in two miles, we're going to be slowing down. And, oh, wait, now it's a mile. Oh, here we are. Here's our exit. That's what your speech should sound like. You should 
be giving people cues as to where the terms are and where the ending is. Um, so these are some reasons for a conclusion. You hit the idea again, you summarize your key points, and in persuasion, and only in persuasion do you need to do the fourth one, challenge the audience to respond. So anything that works in the introduction will work in the conclusion. Again, if you want to use the same quotation, that is fine. If you want to go back and give the rest of the story like Paul Harvey did and have a narrative approach, you can do that too. But you need to at least say, today I've covered a lot of ground here. This is what I've told you. If you remember two things, this is what I'd like for them to be. Um, and Steve Jobs always gave a little in additional inducement. I always think about reasons to give blood. And if you're going to give a persuasive speech about blood donation, there are a whole lot of great reasons. For one thing, we cannot manufacture human blood. It has to come from somebody else. Um, summertime is a shortage. There's more accidents and there's less people giving blood. So um, the additional inducement be, hey, and if you come give blood, we'll give you a free lunch. Um, maybe that's not the reason they should go get blood for the free food or the t-shirt, but it's just a little additional reason. Maybe that'll get someone um, to take time out of their schedule. Just one more thing. And in persuasive speeches, you will be compelled to ask for the close of give a call to action. Even if you're asking people just to think about a plan of action or to think differently about something, you want to make sure at the end you reiterate what that is. So today I told you uh, why using the word retarded is a really bad thing to do, how it offends groups of people and is usually not used in an accurate way. The next time you hear the word, I'd like for you to think about the reaction that it gives you and um, I challenge you to eliminate it from your vocabulary. So that's kind of a combination of to think and to do. So uh, anything that works in the intro again will usually work in the conclusion and again will provide a holistic, well-rounded speech. So today we've covered a lot about why organization is important. Go into your speech with a plan that will help your nerves and practice that speech according to the plan, knowing that it may not go the same way each time. And that is the beauty of an extemporaneous delivery. It does not need to be canned. It does not need to sound the same every time. So I challenge you to give a, an organized speech and to use an outline with keywords to make that happen. I look forward to hearing your speeches.